Okay, John. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Welcome to the world of Mark Catesby. Catesby was an Englishman, a naturalist, an artist, and explorer. He came to the South Carolina colony in 1722, nearly 300 years ago. His illustrations and descriptive text would later comprise his publication, The Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands, one of the most important books of natural science in that century and the most expensive book of that century. Could we move on to the slides? Yes, there we are, good. All right, uh, next slide, slide please. Uh, Catesby as a youth showed interest in the world of nature and he made frequent visits to the home of his grandfather at the village um, at Castle Headington, at Headingham in Essex. And it was his grandfather, Nicholas Jekyll or Jekyll, who had a bot botanical garden of some note, and he, probably his grandfather introduced Mark to John Ray, a founder of modern biology nomenclature, and to Samuel Dale, another prominent natural scientist and neighbors of his grandfather. In his, in his 30s, Catesby accompanied his, uh, his sister, Elizabeth, to Colonial Williamsburg in 1712, and there he was uh, able to collect and send specimens and seeds, that is, specimens of animals and seeds of plants, uh, to Samuel Dale back in England, to his grandfather, and to Thomas Fairchild, another natural scientist. Okay, uh, next slide, please. When Catesby returned to England 17 year, seven years later in 1719, he was somewhat of a celebrity because some of his specimens were unknown until then by uh, Europe. Um, because of his success uh, in Virginia, he was nominated to be an ex a naturalist explorer for the Carolina colony uh, by a number of um, scientists, William Sherrod and Hans uh, Sloan. Uh, to the, this, these nominations were made to the Royal Society, that is the Royal Society of London for natural knowledge. And it was presided over by Sir Isaac Newton. So that's our South Carolina's connection to Sir Isaac Newton. And so Catesby was chosen to travel to Carolina to collect specimens, take notes, and to make drawings of Carolina flora and fauna. Next slide. Okay, um, you can imagine the cultural shock and climate shock that Catesby faced when he arrived in May of 1722. The hot, humid weather and the uh, colonial culture with its large labor force of enslaved persons and its newly but sparsely populated backcountry settled by Germans, Swiss, Swiss, French Huguenots, English, and Scots. Okay, also it was a, a period of danger, but as uh, James Stewart and the Powder Magazine mentioned earlier, but, uh, because of the, the Yamasee War was in 1715, 1716, so it would have only been a decade before. And also because of the death of John Lawson a decade earlier, another naturalist uh, killed by the Tuscarora in uh, the North Carolina colony.
Okay, next slide, please. All right, uh, this is a, an, another map of uh, Colonial South Carolina. The light blue uh, dash uh, path would have most probably been the path that Mark T Catesby took from Charleston to Fort Moore. He, again, as I said earlier, he arrived in May and he was ready to begin his work with the backing of the Royal Society he wanted to begin. He met um, in the Charleston area, many of the prominent plantation families, the Warings, the Skeens, and the Moors. Uh, James Moore Jr., um, who lived um, in the Goose Creek area, probably was instrumental in helping Catesby uh, put together a um, group of militia to escort him to Fort Moore. Um, they, uh, they traveled on pack horses and horse and horses with, without packs, of course, um, along that 110 mile, 140 mile um, track. Okay, um, Fort Moore, as most of you know, is in the Silver Bluff area of Aiken County on the South Carolina side across from Augusta. And um, there, it can, there is the Silver Bluff Nature Preserve um, there um, in the uh, Silver Bluff area. Uh, Catesby wanted to see all parts of the Carolina colony and he did not want to be on the same spot in the same month, two years in a row. So for example, if he was in Charleston in the spring, then he would not want in the next year, he would not want to be in Charleston in the spring again. Um, he uh, was the first to name the geographical areas of South Carolina that weren't used to any great use until the 20th century, but he named the Midlands, the Pine Belt, the Sand Hills area, and he also used the term the Piedmont for the upper uh, back country, the up country. All right, next slide. John? John Jameson. Next slide, slide, please, sir. Can you hear me? John is my projectionist today. John, can you hear me? Yeah. And um, I'm trying to get it to go. Okay. Well, although I can continue to speak, although there there is no uh, text uh, as proof that he went to Fort Congaree or to Camden, we do suspect that he did visit there because he was interested in seeing the Sand Hills as well as the Upper Midlands. There we go. Can you move forward to the next slide? Yeah, there we go. Um, Catesby was a keen observer of, of birds and he makes a point in his text that he drew um, birds from life rather than birds that were killed, unlike John James Audubon. He makes a point of that he that he tried to at uh, at most times draw birds from life. Uh, these are bobolinks or rice birds. 
uh, but for the interest of, in the interest of time, I don't have a whole lot of his uh, artwork, uh, but you can um, see those in, in various websites, at various websites. Um, he was very interested in observing the movements of the rice birds that were in Charleston and at the rice plantations in May, and then they moved away. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? Uh, these are uh, three areas in which he uh, was a uh, forerunner of modern day or scientific thought. He was a, big, uh, a forerunner of thought about bird migration um, in the late 1700s, or excuse me, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, birds were thought to hibernate rather than migrate. They were thought it was thought that birds hibernated like bats. And he, through observation, just, uh, reported that birds, in fact, do migrate. And in part, it was his observations of the rice birds and their movement to follow the rice season from Charleston, from the Charleston area to the Bahamas that led him to make this conclusion all right, next slide. All right, also he, re he wrote about the effects of man and weather. Um, he also concluded that the further north to colder, cl colder climates, the smaller uh, um, the same species was in his findings. All right, next slide. All right, also he discusses the limits of natural resources. He tells the story of traveling with a group of men up the Savannah River and in fishing a number of his um, fellow travelers overfish and leave lots of fish behind. And it, he remembers the incident um, 10 years later and includes it in his book. And he's, so he was sensitive to the limits of natural resources and the waste, the potential waste of natural resources, even in America. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the Carolina parakeet. Um, again, just the part of the, the uh, drawing. Uh, he, uh, eliminated or tried to eliminate perspective and shading. That's why his birds seem so flat and primitive to us. But he believed in order to encourage scientific understanding, he limited shadowing and limited um, use of depth or perspective. So his fellow, fellow scientists could um, view the birds um, more uh, basically. Um, and again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, his natural history book was considered the, the book of the year, the book of the century, I should say, with um, 220 plates, that is 220 illustrations, 109 birds, but it also included reptiles, amphibians, fish, insects, and other mammals, and of course, plants. All right, next slide. All right, so we're uh, less than two years away from 2022 in which South Carolina will be celebrating the tricentennial of his visit to South Carolina. And we are already in the planning stages of a number of events. Our kickoff event, event will be Earth Day, Earth Day weekend, which is April, the 23rd and 24th, we will have an event at the Congaree National Park that weekend. Uh, it will include bird walks led by members of the Audubon Society and several presentations on birding, history, and Native American bird lore. And uh, there will be a 
set of resource tables uh, manned by conservation groups and the Audubon Society. So it promises to be a very exciting event. And there will be other events throughout the year 2022 in the Low Country and in the Midlands. So please join us for 2022. Did, any questions? Any questions from anyone? What? Yeah, I, I'm going to just talk while it goes, if that's okay. Okay, that's right. Okay, so, sorry about that, folks. Um, uh, so we're talking about the, the period, the prehistoric period. We're talking about the Congaree um, who lived uh, at the junction of the Congaree Creek and the Congaree River. Um, people could follow the rivers to the coast or, or back again up to the fall line. Once you got to the fall line, uh, you know, if you had goods or whatever, you would have to unload them and, and put them on pack horse trains or uh, even human burdeners would have to carry like materials into the back country. And uh, so this area uh, here became a very important even during ancient times because the fall line was here. And the fall line um, allowed people to cross the river from east to west fairly um, uh, it provided a way to do that with like uh, rocks and, and things in the river. Um, so the, uh, we know that there were two ancient trading paths. Um, one of the paths uh, was the Okanichi path that came out of Virginia that um, ended in Augusta, Georgia. It was the, uh, what came to be known as the Catawba path. And the other one was the Cherokee path. And the Cherokee path developed after the Amnesty War. So, um, there was uh, th this path um, would uh, converge and the Catawba would both converge at the area of, near Casey, um, where you will see the development of Congaree Fort One, Congaree Fort Two. You'll see the development of Saxagatha, Granby, and, and all the rest of that. So um, you had lots of uh, Indian uh, diplomats as well as traders moving up and down the path. Um, um, and like uh, was talked about earlier, um, this was one of those trading uh, factories or trading posts when they built Congaree Fort One in 1718. And it became a destination for people, uh, not only coming down from, from uh, Native American villages in the Piedmont and the mountains, but also coming up from Charleston and the coast. Um, and this, uh, this picture here depicts some of the diplomats that were sent to England actually in 1730. So in that area in uh, 1765, you've got the two Camden merchants, uh, uh, um, John Chestnut and uh, Joseph uh, uh, um, uh, Kershaw, who build the Casey House right on the uh, Cherokee Path. It's overlooking the Congaree River on a rise, is what they say. Um, and uh, these two uh, Camden merchants, they have uh, stores at Camden, Shara, and now at the Congaree. So they've, they've got a pretty wide sway over a lot of the backcountry as far as trade. And they have connections to help them with that trade. Um, and they have uh, a trading, um, they have trading partners in Charleston. And these trading partners are connected to uh, Quakers in Philadelphia, who then have access to like international markets. So there's, uh, you know, they're, they're able to draw upon that and um, these areas become uh, areas of trade for not only Native Americans, but also for um, settlers that are coming into the area. Now, um, the, uh, the Casey, the, the, the structure that became the trading post that would become the Casey House, um, we know that the family lived above the store uh, below was areas where you could store materials, um, like uh, if you've got tobacco, you could store it there. If you've got indigo, you could store it there. Later with the coming of, of, the, of cotton, you could store it also there. Um, and, it, and people could also um, carry out uh, trade. Um, there was credit that a lot of the settlers used. And of course you could acquire all of those English goods, all of those things of the Atlantic world you know, whether it's tools or whether it's rum, tea or coffee, you know, all of these things are gonna be coming into this area. There's 
Uh, by 1765, there is the, the old Cherokee path has been expanded into what's going to become the old state road and products are going to travel from the low country from Charleston into this area. It, it's, uh, it said it took, uh, I think a wagon uh, or a, a person on horseback to go 20, day, 20, 20 um, miles a, a day or so. So three or four days for people to reach from Charleston to get here. But you could also put products on boats and they could go down the, uh, the Congaree to the uh, Santee, the Watery and to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so this was a pretty, pretty important place. It sat near a ferry. And so when the Revolutionary War broke out in uh, 1775, and then of course the British come south in 1779, uh, the British want to control the back country and they want places like this store. And so uh, it's near a ferry, it's on a major road. Um, so what are they gonna do? They're gonna occupy, they, they're gonna occupy this store and they're gonna build a palisade around it. They're gonna put a powder magazine. They're gonna pull in a couple of 12 pounders and you're gonna, they're gonna eventually um, call this Fort Granby. Um, and so there's two um, battles at Fort Granby. There's actually four, but we'll start with the first two. General Thomas Sumter in February, 1781, he attacks the fort and he is, um, he is uh, being very successful in taking the fort. He's kind of sieging it, but unfortunately from Camden comes Lord Ralden and Lord Ralden brings a larger British force. So all Sumter can do is blow up the powder magazine and destroy the provisions at the fort. And so um, uh, he has to, of course, um, they can't destroy it in, in that attempt. But the Americans come back and in May 1781, Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, who's the father of Robert E. Lee, serving in South Carolina with the American Legion from Virginia, he is assigned to take the fort. Now, why do they want it? They, they want it because it's, it's storing provisions for the British and those provisions can be distributed to the back country. So um, Lighthorse Harry Lee, he is able to roll a cannon up to the Congaree River on a very foggy morning. Um, and uh, once he gets it up to the, to the edge of the river, when the fog lifts, they begin a bombardment of the structure. And then of course, um, he also begins to take the grounds uh, around the fort. And after several hours of this, the British commander who's Andrew Maxwell, who's with the Prince of Wales Regiment, will re um, uh, surrender the fort. Um, and he and um, one of the things that uh, takes place with this is that uh, uh, he offers very good terms to to Major Maxwell when he surrenders the fort, um, and uh, the, that makes Sumter kind of mad in the men. So Lighthorse Harry Lee has to skedaddle. By the way, we have a cannon. We have several cannonballs from this battle at the KC Museum. So this is just one example. If you haven't been, you can come by and see a couple of the, the examples from the, the battle that took place there. There are two other stories that, want, that go along with the Casey House. One is the story of Emily Giger. Um, Emily is supposedly an 18 year old uh, young woman and she uh, volunteers to take a message from uh, Nathaniel Green to General Sumter. She has to ride through the British lines so she sets out with this message, this piece of paper that, that has a message from one general to another. And she is unfortunately captured by the British. And she is taken to the upstairs of the structure. And Lord Ralden is, is commanding it at the time. And Lord Ralden says, uh, well, young lady, I'm, I'm too much of a British gentleman to search you, but I'm going to send for uh, another lady to come in and search you. So uh, supposedly Emily is locked in the room. She takes out the message she has. She, um, she reads it, memorizes it. She tears the message up and Emily eats the message. And therefore she becomes a true heroine of the American Revolution in doing so. Um, we also uh, have uh, our setup, our Emily Giga room. The other story uh, goes along with uh, General Lord Charles Cornwallis. He's overall commander of the British troops in the South. And um, he was one day playing on his elegant tea table out in the field, playing cards supposedly. And he didn't realize Americans were sneaking up with him. When he did, he dropped his cards and left his table. Well, a Colonel Troutman supposedly um, took the table and 
through marriage, this table has passed along um, to the Casey family. And so um, this is a story that we have, and we have the table that the Casey family um, um, said is General um, Lord Cornwallis's table at our museum. Come by and see that also. Um, let's see, after the, um, after the uh, revolution, uh, Colonel Troutman, uh, uh, he actually acquired the trading post and uh, he, um, he ran it for a while as a trading post again, but then by 1817, um, you have uh, James Casey purchasing the property. And uh, James Casey, um, he, uh, his uh, members of his family are um, uh, uh, prominent there. They open the doors to people traveling through the area. Uh, um, Caroline Casey is one of the ones that uh, is there. She marries a uh, Casey in 1863 during the Civil War. So they, they serve as soldiers, they serve as people, you know, also all the way through the 20th century, they serve as people as they come in and out of the Casey area and it becomes a landmark because it's on that old state road here in, in Casey. Um, so uh, the family will actually uh, live in the structure of the 1921 Caroline Casey, um, one of her children uh, is going to be um, a guy named uh, William Casey. Um, William, William Casey is going to become affectionately known as Uncle Billy Casey. Uh, this is a picture of Uncle, well, you saw the baby, that was him. And then this is a picture of him as an older man. And uh, so he builds a railroad spur. He has a, a business, this business still stands, the building still stands in Casey by the railroad tracks. He builds a spur to meet up with the, um, the main railroad um, and um, he's able to move goods back and forth and people begin to put businesses in this area. And this becomes known as Casey Crossing. There's a quarry here that, that supports that. There's several other, there, the railroad builds a, a um, construction yard there or a repair yard. So there's several different uh, businesses that support this. And when the people get ready to name this town, um, they, they, um, they name it supposedly after Casey because he was able to do and bring those, um, those things to the area. Uh, the last person living in the house is Caroline Casey. She uh, will pass away in 1921. Um, there is people that um, inhabited the house. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's, there, the Casey's moved away from the house. A lot of the family moved in ta into town and there's a second Casey house in town that, that has started. But the older, the house is abandoned in 1921 with the death of Caroline Casey. Um, and so the house is really gonna sit abandoned um, there for a while. Um, we have pictures from the 40s that show, show the house. Sure. There was a couple more slides there, John. Um, I'm not sure if you can make it go forward or not. But uh, so the, the house uh, was abandoned. And um, what happened was uh, supposedly, um, you know, it, it sat near the quarry. Um, people uh, began to take materials off the house. They began to remove items from the house like bricks and um, uh, wood to, to build into their own houses during this period. It wasn't really protected. Um, the, uh, there was a storm that kind of damaged parts of it. And so by, uh, in this, this was in 1948. So by 1952, um, the, the, the Casey house had effectively been dismantled. Whatever was left there was gone and the quarry had quarried that site. So the, the site where the house sat is no longer there. Um, now, if you come to the KC Museum, we, we do have some um, objects from the KC family that we can show you. And, and obviously the objects, you know, that we found around the trading store, around the fort, these were all uh, found prior to um, the quarry digging this area up. Um, if you're on the Riverwalk uh, down near KC today, 
Um, you're going to see um, two, uh, you'll see the, the river on one side and the other side, you're going to see this high mound of dirt. That's the quarry where they like dump dirt from digging and, and whatnot. So um, the Casey House, um, unfortunately, it is lost to us, but uh, we continue to tell that story here at the Casey Museum. Okay, uh, Andy, um, thanks for my, I'm sorry about those technical glitches. Um, um, we had a few this time. <laughs> um, we'll, we're going to work, we actually, believe it or not, rehearsed this, but uh, uh, I'm going to uh, share the screen here uh, and we'll, we could close out. Uh, can you see? My slide? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending this, this program. And I urge you, we're going to have another Zoom session on next Thursday, the 12th, uh, or this Thursday, the 12th, on uh, trees and forests in the 12,000 year park and the Congaree Basin. And then on the 19th, on the week from Thursday, uh, we're going to have a, a program, which is a virtual version of our Battle of Congaree Creek presentation that we have in the park. Um, I want to uh, thank everybody for attending. Please um, uh, check our schedule on our website and Facebook, and uh, we'll be sending out the invitations for these other um, programs. And um, thanks again, all the speakers. Um, we had some technical glitches, but I think we got through it. And uh, there was a lot learned today. And it was very, very good context for the 18th century. So thanks, everyone, for attending. Is there, is there any questions uh, that anybody has for any of the speakers today? I just wanted to say two things. Um, at the State House, there's also a memorial to Emily Geiger in the lobby that you can see. And if you go to um, Revolutionary War Field Day in Camden, on the British side, there is a table set up with the card game oftentimes, which is really cool too. It was nice to hear about it. Okay. Anyone else? John, this is Nelson McLeod. I'll say a couple things. Uh, I've heard uh, Giger and Geiger today. Uh, the people I know who use that name say in South Carolina say Giger, whereas I think the rest of the world says Geiger probably. And uh, another thing is, uh, why do we always refer to the township plan as a scheme versus a plan or something along those lines? Is there some reasoning to that? Um, um... Sue may be able to answer that better. I, my understanding is that's the way it's referred to in the literature and how it was defined formally. Uh, and today's meaning of scheme is more negative, <laughs> I agree. And we should probably just switch to calling it a plan, but it was, it's defined uh, in the text as schemes that the state, the state came up with. So that, that's why that term is used. That's interesting. But I agree, I think we should, we should just say plan. We still use scheme to kind of address similar things, projects, strategies, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's interesting how the context of our terminology changes uh, and what was perfectly acceptable then and understandable is we have to, we have to take time to explain today that we're not scheming in, against anybody. <laughs> uh, all right, well, if, if uh, there are no other questions, I want to thank again everybody for attending. We um, have one more question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. person is here with me. Uh, Mary Louise Robinson, I'm a Camden girl, and uh, I wanted to ask with the French and Indian War, uh, what were other sites over South Carolina? Uh, there, there are not many. Um, uh, Fort Dorchester, maybe. 
What's that? Fort Dorchester. Uh, Fort Dorchester, uh, Fort Congaree too is kind of that era. And we'll be talking about that in a future presentation. Uh, but there wasn't a lot in the Midlands that I'm aware of. Uh, Saxe Gotha was roughly that time period, but uh, it overlapped there a little bit. Uh, there are sites like um, Fort Frederica in Georgia that were part of that war that extended from the 1740s. Not a lot in the Midlands, and I'm not aware of too much in Charleston. Um, I'm, I'm sure there were things going on, obviously. Of course, across the mountains uh, would have been um, a South Carolina fort built in Tennessee named Fort Loudon, which sat on the Little Tennessee River um, and was one of those flashpoints, you know, as you're, as you're heading towards this major conflict um, with the French. Um, and I, in fact, I think, you know, Governor Glenn tried to um, make the focus in that direction you know, while Governor Dinwiddie up in Virginia was saying, hey, no, you know, it's here in the, on the Pennsylvania frontier, so. Yeah, and I think, uh, Andy, depending on how you define French and Indian War, the period, uh, Fort, Prince George, Fort Prince George uh, was uh, contemporaneous with Fort Congaree II in the 1750s. Um, and I, there was some things going on um, at Gowdy's Trading Post in the 1760s, or part of the end of the Cherokee War in 1760. So depending on your definition, um, in the Midlands though, I'm not aware of very much in terms of physical sites that we can talk about. And I, I'll just say one more thing. There's a story that goes along with the um, French and Indian War. It's connected with um, the Fort Two that we're talking about. And uh, it's the, the story of Peter Mercer. And Peter Mercer was a French Huguenot and uh, he was from Georgia, but he came and he served in South Carolina with the company that was assigned to Fort Congress too. And uh, Peter Mercer, uh, in fact, all the independent companies through South Carolina got an order in 1754 that one third of their troops would be detached from each of those companies and they were to meet in Charleston. So Peter Marcer uh, was located at Fort Congaree II. He and one third of his men marched to Charleston along with these other companies. They gathered, they got on a ship, went up to Virginia, they got off the ship, they marched into what was called the Ohio country, which was really Western Pennsylvania. And uh, the most remarkable thing about that is they met up with a new Virginian who had just been given command and his name was George Washington. And George Washington, of course, built Fort Necessity. And they had the first battle that touched off the French and Indian War. And not only that, um, Peter Mercier was killed and George Washington gave him high um, praise. And not only George Washington, but also Benjamin Franklin gave um, Peter Mercier high praise. And, uh, and that's because he continued to fight even though he was wounded um, he, he actually received three wounds before he died. So that's a, that's a neat little connection from this area um, that ties into that French and Indian War stuff. Okay. Um, also, uh, later on our virtual programs on uh, December 8th, we're, having, we're focusing on Fort, First Fort Congaree in a detailed discussion there. We do talk a little bit about the French and Indian War period there. And then on December 15th, our program uh, on the Congarees, we're going to have a, a wider scope of talking about all the activities that happened in this, what is known historically as the Congarees. So we'll be having more detail on that. Uh, again, not a lot of physical sites, but um, a, lot of, you know, a lot of the activities that were ongoing you know, during that time frame. Hey, John, this is Nelson McLeod again. Sure. Uh, Ty and I believe we heard mentioned a while ago that the, the Casey house was uh, originally built by Adamson as one of the partners in the mercantile business. Um, and Kershaw and Chestnut. Excuse me? Kershaw and Chestnut. Okay, I'm sorry. Adamson was uh, a, um, a Camden person and uh, Lieutenant James Adamson was one of the officers who was assigned at Fort Loudon when it was massacred and I believe was killed there if I'm not mistaken. 
Okay. Any more questions? That's, that's interesting. Nelson, I hope you'll, uh, you and others can tune in on our other programs because these kinds of uh, side uh, stories are very interesting to bring into the discussion. May I have a question more of the township system? When, when was uh, the township system developed and when did it terminate? Um, I believe it, 1730 is when it was um, uh, brought into to, brought into line. Um, it, it operated, I think, until the early 1770s when they redefined the, the 96th district and other um, uh, political divisions at that time. Is that your understanding, Andy? I, I understand the beginning was 1730. I, I'm not sure about when you would say the end would be because um, by then, I think it would started off as 10 planned townships. And I think nine of them, I'm not sure if all 10 got established, but then nine of them got established, I think, is what I'm remembering. But, um, you know, and, and then of course, it, it ends up with the question of um, is Charles, you know, as we get towards the revolution, um, people are not happy with like not having powers in their own areas to be able to conduct legal business or whatever. So that we, we end up to with that regulators and the modern the moderators, yeah, so. all that stuff. Yeah, uh, I think the uh, closer to the revolution, they were realizing that um, they needed to have more representation uh, in the back country and they were starting to redefine uh, districts. <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> okay. I, I would like to ask uh, James a question if he's there. Um, James, I, I was just wondering where things are now with like pigs and things um, as far as, you know, archaeology in the area. But there's your study, the fort, is what I was saying. I'm, I'm sorry, Andy, could you repeat that? Yeah, so it's, right now, uh, what are the plans, kind of archaeology, um, more, archaeolo more archaeology to be conducted on the fort? Another field season going on, or how's that going to work? You know, well, I, I'm unaware of any active projects in the park, um, and I'm reluctant to take any uh, field work on until I've got this um, uh, earlier field work published and, and uh, kind of fully um, fleshed out. But there is potential for, uh, and when I say potential, I mean for the types of resources that are out there, there there's a wealth of potential out there for doing additional projects. Oh, crap, where did my coupon go now? We may be uh, pursuing some grant monies to do that. Um, that's certainly something I'm gonna be recommending that the city do. Any more questions? Guys, I think we can wrap it up. Again, thanks for your attending. Uh, we'll see you uh, next on Thursday for the discussion of uh, trees and forests in the Congaree Basin. And on the 19th, the uh, discussion of, uh, or the virtual tour of the Battle of Fort Congaree. Um, uh, and that will be uh, given by our volunteer guides. Thanks very much for your attendance. Um, it was great seeing everyone and thank you. Have a good week and a good weekend. Thank, thank you, you for hosting everything, John. Okay, thank you guys. Sorry for the glitches, but uh, we're, we're learning as we go. And I think, um, um, I think most of the material got across. I'm, I'm glad about that. Thanks for speaking up, Andy. That helped a lot. Yeah. Thank, thanks, John. Great, great job. Thank you, John. Y'all take care.
Till next time. Bye-bye.